All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning back into the Dali Talks podcast. As always, you know that I try my best to find amazing speakers that can teach you um, things that you probably would not even think of asking. So today I have my amazing friend, Jovi Daniel. She's the host and podcast producer of Jovi D and Chumbita Chronicles. Those are two separate ones. So check them out. They're everywhere that you listen on pod, uh, uh, for pod. They're everywhere <laughs> that you listen to podcasts at. Um, no te and me ponga nerviosa. I dale. know it. In my propio show. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing. We're going to do this in Spanglish. Así de que prepárense. But Jovi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. I like your purpose, your intention, your work. I am so honored to be here for you to have me. And, you know, spreading the word uh, that I think we share something in common, even though you do it for bullying, which is all comes out to feeling confident, self-pride, protect your mindset. And then I have been doing this in my journey, uh, realization with, um, be, as, you know, recognizing, acknowledging my Afro-Latinidad you know, especially in the U.S. Yeah. Well, you know, when I, when I met you through Clubhouse and you talked about educating our youth about Afro Yes, that's what we're and hearing. Not, yes. Yeah. And not just Afro-Latino youth, but all youth, because there is a lot of unknowing um, going on out there and we make assumptions and that can be very hurtful and damaging to people in every aspect of life. Yes, um, yes. But before we dive right into how you got into starting up these two podcasts to talk about these type of topics, tell us a little bit about your background. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? What was there a catalytic event that catapulted you to do what you're doing today? Correct, correct. Well, yes, definitely. Let's do like a reverse. <laughs> and it all started with the Joby D show because, well, it all started when he, I got laid off three times in the period of five years. Ooh, I'm going to leave that for, there's obviously a lot there to cover, yeah. but mm -hmm. then we're going to make it very brief. But with that being said, I also, um, I moved from, I was born in Panama. I came as an adult to the United States. And I was, I, I landed in Miami. So with that being said, I did my college. I was old enough to do college and started my, my period there as a young adult. And, um, my mom still lives down there. And, um, that was, that was that for a while. And then I got an opportunity because the pool, when it comes to this career and entertainment TV was kind of like changing and it was like time to make I'm open. Needless to say, after 14 years of being in Univision, mm -hmm. which is my roots boot camp, wherever I learned everything that I know today and applying it, I got laid off in 2013. And um, pretty much very soon, which I really had this feeling that I was like, mm, this break is nice, but I don't, I don't think it's going to last too long. And I got uh, a friend reach out to me and she's like, hey, I have this opportunity in LA. Will you come? You know, I'm putting a team together. And I was like, why not? Sure, let's do this. And the power of, you know, what you wish, what you're looking for. And I've been feeling like that for a long time. And I was like, there has to be something more to life. So this opportunity came up. I hop on it and it was just like, daddy, everything that my, my apartment got sold, like everything that I need to get rid of. It was just everything just pa pa happening really quickly being, being that, but it was just amazing. Like to say, you know, when God takes over, <laughs> it's like, listen, so I made it out here. I liked it, you know, it was cool, different weather. It took me forever to, to adjust. But then somewhere in the parameters and the intersectionality of being Black and having an accent and many other things, it was very disruptive. It was disruptive in the sense that, like I pretty much have mentioned, 
in my personal experience, when I'm in Miami, they will tell me, hey, tú eres cubana, venezolana, puertorriqueña. And I'm like, no. And in LA is, ¿y por qué usted habla el español también? ¿Quién le enseñó? Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, yeah. wait a minute. <laughs> What happened here? Mm -hmm. And now I laid that out and then I left the country because the the network has shut down completely in 2016, 2017. I actually, I had an opportunity in RCN. RCN is a big network in Colombia. The other producers are many, many great productions. One of them, I was, this is Betty La Fea and many more. And I was at the network and that, I was out of the country and that was really cool to be back in Latin America, touching your roots and realizing a lot of things. So I was like, well, that was great. I like this. I did that for like five months, came back to LA only to like, oh, the economy is great. I should be able to get a job. Even though when I even took upon that job abroad, everybody was like, are you sure you want to leave? This is the high moment. And I was like, oh, I should be fine. You know, here the economy is going. But I really did not understand the whole layer um, culturally, socio, societal of LA. So then when I came back and kind of figured out, I was like, I am, I'm fine. I have a sabbatical. I'm going to get a certificate. Meanwhile, I'm looking for work or, but then I also was an assessment. I'm like, okay, do I really want to go to corporate or this is an opportunity for me to really figure it out, especially knowing already 20, 2016, 17 was already the boom of social media and digital marketing. Mm -hmm. My my own profession as a media planner had changed completely. It kind of morphed into sales all together and one on you know on one person doing all of that. So I had the skills, I had the degrees. Uh, oh, you did like you're bilingual. I talk with my hands, but then I was like, mm, I was listening to crickets and. The next saying is your network is your net worth. Mm -hmm. That those connections, which is true. The only reason, you know, one of the main reasons that I landed there, as I mentioned earlier, was because of a friend. But this is a friendship of many years and collaborating and everything. And then now when I'm in LA, it's like, what? Some of these friends actually end up leaving and it's just like starting from scratch all over, getting to know who's who and all of that. So, Joe, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I have a question before we continue, because I always take the opportunity for my speakers to educate our listeners. Can you explain exactly what a media planner in the, I guess, television industry does? Yes. Yeah. Okay. A media planner is the person that allocates in the system. There's a computer and application system where all the commercials, even the shows, the movies, the novellas, they all have an assigned number in the system. Mm -hmm. So I am that person that allocates. And then we have like total running times and, and you time that. So the system pretty much allocates. And I go also according to, Daytime, afternoon, prime time. Mm -hmm. And within that, you have promos, videos that are actually pushing or retaining your attention right now. You know, now they call it growth hack or demographics or, you know, ratings. So that's what a media planner does. So now, yeah, now a media planner becomes now a media buyer. So not only now you are locating the The, the the commercials or the spots now you actually incentivizing a price based on where and who is watching when wow and so on yeah that sounds like a lot of work <laughs> and it's like <laughs> it a, lot of, a lot of moving parts that's crazy and it's only one person that does this or is there somebody else that does this as well usually it's one or two people I, and then you know. <laughs> pretty, pretty much like we are like the 
el precipicio antes de master control, I was not going to say it in uh -huh. English, like right before it goes on the air, when master control, the operators, that's, that will be me, 24 hour, you know, be on call, 24-7, and yeah, yeah, wow. that, because everything that's supposed to be ready on the, for the air, on the air, you talk to producers, editors, uh, a lot of people, marketing, sales, Because it's just all those little things that you see on your screen or even when you're watching your streaming services, all of that, somebody has to do that. Mm, wow. That's <laughs> su super high attention to detail and very yes. organized. Porque si no, uh -huh. toda la cosa falls apart. Wow. So oh, then it takes it takes nothing. And it's like, I have a saying, like, you know, you're just as good as your last <laughs> movie or your last run <laughs> you know because it really yeah. doesn't take that much mm -hmm. it's like when it comes out great it's amazing but it just takes como dice, una pieza, just a puzzle and it's like Wah. wow wow that's incredible so you are in this industry you start in miami and you're going to la and then from there you take a sabbatical go to panama work with networks colombia here. colombia 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 and then you come back to la And then you're like, okay, something's got to give here. Something's, do I really want to, what am I going to do now? So, so what happened? So somewhere along the way, meanwhile, I'm kind of getting a certification, I think in social media, because that's pretty much what I, what I have. But then meanwhile, I'm applying, I'm like, I'm getting all these interviews, but I am not getting any further, maybe like interview number one, interview number two. You know, so then you get like kind of restless and I'm like very resourceful and I kind of use a lot of tools or anything that was available to for me. And and then I was like, you know what, if I'm going to talk and I've always had this urge of like, I think at this point, um, the information, the education, the experience that I have, I would like to share it somehow. How mm -hmm. can I channel this? That was one. And then I was like, well, I I have tried many times to build a business or a side hustle like they call it today something and for some reason one or the other just doesn't work out and I'm like okay let me try again but this time I'm going to tap on the resources of people that have done it in a successful way and transferring skills that's what they call it mm -hmm. and innovating yourself you know giving yourself another chance or rebirth a set you know second or third chance mm -hmm. so that's how the birth of the joby d show started it started like if i'm gonna just give my age here like at those mtv journals like the hidden room where you sit there the confessionals mm -hmm. the confessionals <laughs> and then you just start mm -hmm. and i started doing the audio journal there and then i met a lot of people through the app anchor app and collaborating seeing amazing um skills talents and you know you give yourself to know and then everybody's like joey joey um you know you love you black and latina and the accent and i was like yeah the accent is kind of like something huh and I, it's not i'm not gonna get rid of it i'm mm -hmm. like in the words of sofia vergara you know as i said i came as an adult it's there it's not going away yeah and And then it becomes, you know, your power instead of being criticized, even bullied for the matter. And say, actually even looking at this, it's like, know that if I have an accent or anyone that has an accent, it means that they speak more than one language. Exactly. I'm so glad that you said that because, you know, I was made to feel ashamed of having an accent when I was learning English. And then I was made to feel ashamed of my parents because they had an accent. And I regret that now because uno no sabe cuando está chiquito, you're so insecure and you're learning of like, oh, that's wrong. Oh, okay. Something's wrong with me. And it's not. I remember um, the realization I had when I got older thinking, oh my gosh, that was number one, so wrong for people to assume that just because you have an accent, there's something wrong with you or that you're unintelligent when in fact you are living proof that you are probably even more intelligent or at least more dedicated and disciplined than others to learn another language um. and to learn it so well. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I even learned to say, well, uh, if I have an accent, then that's my shield of pride. 
That's right? My, oh my god, I yeah. love that. I want to. I want to yeah. definitely use that in my shield. Yeah, product. that's like I, I, that's your that's your proof of you know like you are that disciplined, very highly in, intelligent person that you were able to grasp not just another language but even uh, navigate into another culture, you know, how we have to assimilate. Merge, it's like, you merge, gotta be here, yeah. pero no, yeah, you know, like, ni, ni, ni de aquí, ni allá. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, but go ahead, continue, continue, because I want to learn more so, about the Chronicles. Yeah, no, I'm glad that you highlight those things. It's really, really important because of it. Um, so, you know, once you're in there, you know, once you're in the moment, you're like, you're not realizing it, but then understanding, and then people seeing you, and allowing myself also to be seen that way. And I was like, I really took it upon myself and I empower myself. I think it was one of my ha- first hashtags. I do it all with an, with an accent. I do it. It's like, yeah, turn it around, empower it. Mm-hmm. They call it reverse engineering, whatever. But it's like, turn it, turn it to you, what helps you. So the Jovidi started by interviewing former employees, or corporate employees that have ventured into entrepreneurship, how they have transitioned or how they made that, that hop or, you know, jump into and realizing not only that, you know, is realizing also that economic, economically you have to tap into other things that you want to do and create for yourself. The, the days of, if you're fortunate enough of one job and and a great income, a salary is not viable. And I, especially here in LA or even it's happening pretty much everywhere around the world. We're getting pushed more and more financially to realize that we cannot live on on, on one income. We have to create other, other sources of stream. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, so and it being, you know, for the ones that were not even close anywhere into retirement. So that was one. And then right after that comment, I think after a year of Jovi D show podcast, I started dabbing on Conchovita Chronicles. And I remember that again, I started like a solo podcast, a confessional journey, presenting situations that I've occur to me and then just slowly but shortly people young people started navigating young women gravitating to to the message and I was like here on my phone you know doing the best that I could and I was like wow and then when I was getting these um comments reviews dms you it's just like people just relating so much that they finally had a space to I see you and I see myself. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was blown away. Yeah. Was That's beautiful away. and powerful. Yeah. yeah. So Jovi, um, please tell us what does Chombita mean? Okay. Chombita means, let me go back. Panama. If you know anything about Panama City, Panama, not Panama City, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Panama City, Panama um, has a very enriched culture where because of the canal, which uh, the canal, and actually before the canal was the railroad. So with that being said, a lot of migrants from the Caribbean, Caribbean heritage that, you know, came up, came and, you know, landed. When we talk about, even go further back in the past, the transatlantic slave trade and all of that, you know, it's all about us, where the boat made the stop and, you know, allocated everybody mm-hmm. or distributed everyone. Mm-hmm. Because remember, we were not seen as people. We were just stocks and mm-hmm. stuff. Like that. So anywho, fast forward. The, the workers that were used to work in the sugar cane, cottons, and all of those things, that started facing out because of the, what is it, industrial revolution. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so then they started coming to Panama for the railroad. We had a the first country that had a transatlantic railroad that came from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean, which is that. So that influence that, and most of them came from uh, English speaking colonies, British colonies and so forth. And 
later on more like more we had more workers from for the Panama Canal that that did that so for use me as an example my heritage greatly comes from Jamaicans mm -hmm. from Grenada mm -hmm. from San Andres mm -hmm. but then when I was a kid I was actually speaking English mm -hmm. Most like you know, and then within my household, and then when I started going to school, that's when I started speaking Spanish. That's the reason why in Panama you see a lot of people with really particular names, like you would say, Yo soy Alfonso Clark, uh, mm -hmm. Yo soy Raúl, um, what is it? Keraton, Claudio, uh -huh. you know, and then you like Spanish names with, uh -huh. with last names in English. That's one. So now we're coming back to the word Chombita. Chombita means a black girl or black woman, Afro-descendant, Afro-Caribbean. But the, the, the derivative of that word is actually in English Patois, what they would say, young boy. So somewhere between they will say young boy, young boy. If you mentioned it several times, you, and then you came with the, which was a derogative, chombo. But then we also started, you know, grabbing and connotating and empowering that word. Because today you have a very well-known DJ chombo. But mm -hmm. that is the pride of converting that word of saying, we acknowledge that we're black. We acknowledge also our Caribbean heritage and influence and all of them. So Chombita Chronicles, that's what it came about. That's where, how I put it together. Okay. Wow. I had no idea. So that's funny yeah. because we, we do have a lot of words in, in, in Spanish that derive from trying to say something in English, but, um, I want to go back to something you said, de que creciste hablando inglés. Yes. So who, who, what person in the family or, you know, because your last name también is Daniels. Yes. So yes. How, like, at first, at first look, you like, there's nothing that will say that I'm Latina unless you, you know, maybe get my middle name, but my whole, you know, but my, it's my family, my grandmother spoke English. My mom also did. She was actually partially also part of her childhood was in Jamaica with her other grandmother. Mm, and then they started learning because the fact was also that from Cologne, Cologne is a primarily black Afro descendant um, heritage town built. And I don't know. See, I, I'm like, I just know. And then a lot of the West Indian workers from the canal were allocated in, in that area. Because as I said, if you just briefly know anything about the canal, the canal has three locks and now they go through from one end to the other end. So, and then after that, my family allocated into Panama City, but then they're located in around what they would call the canal zone, primarily also working and assisting with the military air bases and so on. So in by the time I think I said as I, I was under five, I was speaking English within the high school. Once I started school and then transferred to another area in the city, going to school, I started picking up the Spanish. And then I would be like talking in Spanish to my grandmother and what is it? And then she will be speaking to me in English and then I will be answering her in Spanish. <laughs> so so the, the, the English that was spoken... Um, was that because you were around Americans that were speaking or British people? West people? Indians, West okay. Indians, uh, Afro, Afro Caribbean, Afro descendant, because the whole, you know, there was a sense of like, yeah, you know, along somewhere in the ways, um, I would say I was present around the time. I was present young enough when I, my grandfather would take me to take a ride on the railroad. That there was Jim Crow's rulings mm -hmm. in certain areas of the canal zone. Yeah, dang, that's crazy. Yeah. Because you know, when we think of Jim Crow, we think the U.S. We don't think anywhere. Well, else. they but. that's one of the things that they brought in, and that was one of the disruptions societals that the Panamanians had, and say, wait a minute, because first it was you know if you think about it, it was really hard for them because. 
you come into my country, you're going to build this thing. Mm -hmm. And then second, you're not going to hire us. I'm talking about the Panamanian mestizos, white Latinos, whatever you want to call it. The ones that are not even in upper class society. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to put this flag and you're not going to honor the sense that you're actually in my country. And then you have these people migrating, Afro Antillanos, or Antillanos. Mm -hmm. And that was another xenophobia and, because they had the advantage of speaking English and they, you know, so it's like a lot of turmoil around that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you just gave me a whole nother side of history that I hadn't learned because I know the military history of the Panama Canal. Exactly. I know part of what you said, but not all of it. So thank you. I love that. Um, (laughs) So how, how is Chombita Chronicles different than the UVD podcast? Okay. Because the first one was very business oriented, etiquette, you know, understanding the pillars of how you execute and get into business or, you know, how you venture into entrepreneurship. And I had a really amazing array of guests because even, you know, you still learn that some people are still working or figuring out what exactly is going to venture in them. And also I, I tap into podcasting the industry to network. I was like, the word out here is not who you know, is who knows you and what, how, what are you good at? Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, let's get this going, Joey, you know? And that was also the trampoline that I got also from the podcast. That everybody was like amazing. I guess, I don't know, it's the sense that everybody has ventured into different roles in their lives. So the podcast community is, is so cool. Like, Years ago in LA, told me to find your niche, find your tribe. And that's what I found in podcasting and, you know, the disposition of people and helping you and elevating you. And I'm also supporting, you know, where I can, everybody else. Yeah, I, I totally agree because um, that was new to me too when I started podcasting. It's pretty, really, really cool. And it can be anybody from anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, it's amazing. Um, so let's pivot a little bit because we wanted to talk about um, one of your passions, which is teaching self-love to us. Yes. So, so how, yeah, how did you start that? And, and what challenges do you still have with delivering that type of information to that demographic? Okay, so, you know, sometimes you feel like you have a message, but then you don't know how to deliver that message. And that's okay. Because I had to get also in a lot of reflection and understanding. The thing is that also when I I was brought up in Panama, the schooling and the education and history was not given to me. I was given this version or the pretty version of mm-hmm. three boats came to the uh, to the yeah. Americas and led <laughs> by Cristobal Colon, you know, and everything was wonderful. And oh, and then suddenly how did our native Indians disappear, you know, whatever. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then that was that. And then, you know, you like fast forward 2013, 2023, and you're like, wait a minute. And then also, let's halt the murder of George Floyd. Mm-hmm. catapult and really kind of put a highlight on the interses- intersectional I never get this word intersectional <laughs> intersectionality of blacks and mm-hmm. understanding that being black the diaspora is spread all over the world yeah however the way that Latin America handled it through a caste system through blanqueamiento, through like, yes, we were in those spaces with the difference of how the United States handle the blackness and the econ- socioeconomic and all those privilege is different and racism and discrimination and everything else. And and everybody's like, yes, it gets tiring of this talk. Like, oh, y'all make it ra- everything racist but Mm -hmm. it is it's in the system it's like we cannot help it and i felt it really really greatly for a point because the way that my life was incurring when i was living here oh i'm living here in la and like applying for these jobs and i was like but it was like oh but you know this you have all these degrees daddy that didn't mean anything around here and not in this town 
you're like, you got to just drop your boots and start all over again. The mm -hmm. system did not know my name, but they know what I am. Mm -hmm. It's like, take a number and you're going to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, you know, I, I am a very shy person, you know, it's ex not extroverted, more actually introverted, but then I have still those extroverted skills. And not only that, life pushes you because it's like a survival mode. You know, you know, you're in this hamstring and you're like, I have to make sure that I can take care of myself, which was, was a great challenge now that I look back because I had a really to push myself in different ways. And sometimes you get caught into also that corporate identity and bubble and that bubble bursts. And then it's like life is going to be like, OK, what are you really made of? Mm -hmm. What can you do for yourself? And adding to the fact that later on, my mom got sick it really you know I really had to help her someone and that kind of cut the period on on my sabbatical and get things going and you know just keep on pushing and pushing play and figuring it figuring this out mm -hmm. yeah so uh what about delivering the information that you've been because you and I when I went to LA and we met we had such a <laughs> we had such an witches. amazing conversation and yes. just feeling your passion about educating young girls is incredible. So can you give us a little bit of information on how you're doing this and what challenges you find when you're doing the work? Okay. When it comes to Afro-Latinidad, like I even also being very transparent with my listeners or with yours, when somebody told me 10 years ago, ah, oh, Joey, tú eres Afro-Latina, I was like, no, I'm Panamanian, I'm Panamanian. But it's called not knowing your history, not getting the facts. And then when you actually learn and then you get angry and then you're like, oh my God. And then you start playing out all these scenes in your life and you're like, oh, that was because of this. That was because yeah. of that. I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Now for something that happened back then because you didn't realize it, you were not educated on it. And yeah, I can completely relate to that. Yeah. So, but the the turnaround about my show, Chombita Chronicles, or even anything that I further do, is about showing that we are in these spaces and that we belong in these spaces. Because I felt for so long that I that I did not. But then I realized I'm like, when I'm having these meetings and board meetings or whatever or presentations, and then I'm like, I'm the only one. Some people was like, "Well, you were tokenized." The point is. I realized that because of education, because the fact that my my family had the privilege, because some of them work in the canal. And then at that time, the United States said, well, you can continue working for us and we can give you our work permit. You can come to the United States, bring your family, blah, 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 all that. Well, we know what's going on these days, but, you know, it's a privilege. I can acknowledge that privilege because it has we know la gente en la frontera, people that are still waiting just to get, like they say, a better life and a better opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's it. I've been in this industry for one. And I'm like, I'm tired. I'm like, why do I have to be the only black person or the woman of color or whatever it is? Maybe, you know, when you get into those places, you only see maybe another brother or another sister. And you're like, okay. But, you know, not all skin folks are king folks but anyways that's another that's another podcast yeah that's another podcast <laughs> that's another. <laughs> but i say i'm like if yo quiero contribuir mi arena to make it possible to infuse to those women men whoever whoever identify as such that you belong there you made it that far and you belong there mm -hmm. no doubt yeah that's the pride that I bring and, and understanding the, the, the dynamics and maybe also having the language to say what you have to say and present yourself in those spaces that my hair is fine. It, when I got the interview of the job that I have today, I was kind of really, you know, shitting bricks, but then I was like, hell no, I'm going to go with my hair just like that. I think the crown not in the crown act, which is a legislation in California, kind of came through. But anyway, anywho, I was like, this is this is how it is. I'm not gonna put on a wig. I'm not gonna relax it. I'm just gonna wear it 
the way that yeah. it yeah. grows out of my hair. Yeah. And that's empowering. Yes. And I think very important for young girls to see that because um, so I have a, a master's in women and gender studies. So we oh, talked no. about, about all of this kind of stuff. And I remember uh, having that discussion about black women with textured hair, how they've had to change their hair. I mean, in even in the military, I saw it with my roommate and it was ridiculous that the military until just maybe a couple of years ago changed the the law, the the policy that yes. now women can wear cornrows and you know certain types of hairstyles and braids and stuff, um, because you just you know there's so much ignorance, including you know when I came to this country, yeah. I was seven, and I tell my daughters this story because I felt so dumb when I realized how much I didn't know, but I had my roommate, she's black from South mm-hmm. Carolina and she relaxed her hair. And yeah. all those years I thought black women would relax their hair for vanity. And I couldn't understand why black women would not get under the water when swimming. I, I thought, know oh, they really, really love their hair. They want it to be looking really nice. And I was like, oh, think- so and I was like, Oh, and then watching my, my roommate and then her just telling me like, what happens if you don't maintain it and why you go to the salon so much and you have to treat. And then knowing the history in, um, especially in the 400 years of slavery of how many women used to use like, you know, the fat of animals to try to, you know, take care of the scalp and how bad it could be. I mean, all <sighs> this stuff, right. And I thought just knowing something like that removes so much prejudice and discrimination and just like the way that you see people. Yeah. And and I'm being honest, I grew up thinking it was a vanity thing because nobody <laughs> exactly, me. you know, mm-hmm. yeah. And the struggle financially, yeah, the the assimilation, because if you didn't look the part, you your survival, everything depends yeah. on it for mm-hmm. you to you know or have a earn a living and until you start paying attention about those things is when you actually see it because if you're oblivious to oh what should you know be paying attention to or that, that that didn't sound i don't know it kind of um it reminds me of that movie from who was it uh colin um uh, no uh capper nickel if you've never seen his yeah. documentary Colin, yes i saw yeah. his documentary yes uh, yes yeah but- where where his parents are like oh no that's not what just happened because they're so oblivious yes. and then yes. I, I remember realizing uh that we do have afro latinos and i was like what wait wait a minute because in nicaragua we had a lot of black people and to me they were just they're just people the and gente de la costa country. usually that's how they say yeah i'm like just they're just my neighbors. But then I came to the US and we have all these labels. And yeah. then you realize, what? You mean all my neighbors were black? <laughs> Como que si no le estaba viendo, like, you know, like the skin color. It's just, you just, it's incredible. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad. I mean, it's a bad thing because then you are unaware of their struggles and you lack the empathy and you're exactly. not the system that helps destroy the discrimination um but there's also kind of like some innocent beauty within where that's like a child just loves a person for who they are they don't even see right know? but it can right. Be, again it can be da- dangerous but anyway so what challenges you think you know that we have especially in latino culture because i think i still meet a lot of people que dicen oh I don't, I don't, I've never heard of the term Afro-Latino, you know? Oh, some people don't mean, you know, identity, as I mentioned, is a very personal thing. But actually, fast forward to um, Panama has, I think, was started in the, and that was, that's another thing. The whole movement or the understanding uh, about self-identity in Panama it took place almost like really like 10 years ago. Like in, I think right after, yeah, 10 or 15 years ago with the census. It's just even recently that they had to reorganize the listing and do like a breakdown for black people Mm -hmm. and in certain terms. 
only to realize that the the out the output or the result of it was 32% of Panamanians identify and see themselves as black. May that be Afro-colonial, Afro-Panameño, Afro-Caribeño, whatever the term, but they they checked the box. And that was pillar, very, very... I'm like... And then coming back here, it's like there's a narrative always, cons- you know... It's, some people say sinister or conspiracy. Maybe I'm not using even the words correctly, but it's just that that underlining, like, okay, when you get here, don't join them because, <laughs> or separate yourself or this thing, you know, somewhere along the community that actually embraced me the most, which is African American community. And because I didn't know their story mm-hmm. or history. Yeah, that's And too. then when you realize that I am being a recipient of what was then what we know now, the affirmative action, uh, or even the civil rights movement, we are getting benefits from all of that. We're reaping all of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think I have seen the need for education about Afro-Latinos within the Black community because I've seen the discrimination towards them because they're like, oh, I thought you was one of us, but you're not. And then so you're not. There's that wall they put up, and okay. yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's like education. yeah. As I said, they, if you fall for the divide and conquer, that's why the black and brown community and all of us. I'm like even the Native Americans, even the way that they they treat our own natives in our country. We know mm-hmm. what they go through and been through, mm-hmm. and you know, and even just a little story that I have. When I graduated from high school, I graduated from a private school. I was in a bilingual English and speakers. And I realized that now looking back, seven of the students, which I was included, we went to practice or did an internship at the administration building, which is part of the Kenna. But then out of those seven students, out of the 40 students that had to do their practice or internship, only one I think was remaining that uh, a girl that got a job. But then all the rest of my classmates that went to practice in private or even public service um, entities, they all got a job. But that's how, like the book says that they have it right now, Rachel Innocence, Rachel, you don't, you don't gas the understanding. At 18, I did not. I think I was like, why was I able to get a job? Mm-hmm. Even though, you know, then again, but then when you look for fast forward, you're like, oh my God, it's, it's all there. Everybody's like, oh, but es que Latin America necesitas palanca. No, there's also anti-blackness, racism. Mm-hmm. We call it classism, colorism, but colorism. you realize that your life is more difficult in order to attain certain things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have um, spoken to people who are new to the U.S. from Latin America. And it's really interesting how, you know, you start speaking with them and they say things like, oh, my gosh, there's so much racism here. Like, there's so much more. I'm like, but there's a lot in your country, too. It's just you don't talk about it. You don't talk about it. Or they say, oh, I didn't know I was Latino. Like, that word, we just don't use or like Hispanic, you know, they're like, ah, you don't, you, people don't label themselves in our country. I'm like, yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, and some people think that's bad. Some people think it's good, but it's just really insightful to speak with somebody who arrives to the United States. And then when they're starting to discover, oh, you know, not every person I see walking down the street is black. Some people don't identify as black. Some you people know? don't, and they can yeah. be Black uh-huh. as yeah, eso me pasó. this microphone, <laughs> and yeah. you have to also respect that because everybody also is in a different stage of understanding, and even if they don't want to, you cannot make it so. Yeah, eso me pasó. I was 19 in army again, another co worker, and she's exactly like you said, super dark. Um, and then there was this other guy who was black from uh Shreveport, Louisiana. And we were having a conversation and something happened where he said something about, yeah, you know, you're black. And she said, no, I'm not. 
And he's like, girl, I'm looking at you. You're darker than me. <laughs> and she said, yeah, but I don't identify as black. I'm West Indy. And then he's, he's, he's saying, um, well, what, well, what is West Indy? I've never heard of that. And I'm going to be honest. I was learning from that conversation. Because I, I was like, what? What do you know? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, wait a minute, let me pay attention here. And it was so another moment where I was like, oh my God, I have, I feel so dumb. Like why, why was, we, why, why am I finding this out now? You know, and it still happens. There's so many people, so many people that, yeah, just because of you might appear to be what you think somebody's, they, they, they're probably not. Even even white people, because I that was another even thing. white, yes. Yeah, I remember in one of my women gender studies classes, my master's, our teacher had the most of them were white. And she started asking, So where are you from? I was like, Oh, I'm from the United States. Like very arrogantly. Like, <laughs> like, like this is where your, your, your generation has always been. You know, you'd be Native American if so. But it's like, no, she, she made them start digging into their history. And then all of them were like, oh, wow, I didn't realize until just having this conversation now that my family descendants are from here, from there. And, you know, it was it was very eye opening. And t picking up on that, what you said, that's another hurdle for anybody in the diaspora, mm -hmm. because the way that everything took place is also very hard to put together your family tree or your inherent like even i feel sometimes now that you like oh people that come from nigeria from ghana they have also a little advantage for the ones that were there because then they they have also a better understanding from the from us that are the generation of generations you know understanding i can go as far as i said earlier jamaica Grenada, and kids San Andres, but then I have to even stick it up further more, you know, to understand how really all took place. Mm -hmm. And now that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, Africans, they know some people find it harsh, and then it's like, oh, why they, but it's like, guys, it's like, come on, let's under, let's better understand each other than again, divide each other. Exactly. Yobi, do you have any book recommendations for people to read, to learn, you know, about some of these misconceptions that still exist? Well, I'm gonna major, yeah, I'm going to do a major shout out because she is the epitome of the moment. I know she's Panamanian also, but she is. Her name is Dash Harris Machado. She have a film that's called Negro, and I think she's working on Negro 2.0. She's been a pillar. And also her uh, collaborator, Javier, they have workshops. And I think right now they have one coming up that is Agosto Negro. Let me just put it here. Okay. So Verano Negro, that's usually how they call, she called it. And she's a speaker, journalist. She has amazing workshops. I've been to her workshops. She will literally break down the whole historic pieces and everything that you have to understand. And also you have, I think, let's see, Dash Harris. I'm going to drop some names. That's okay. And I mentioned the book Racial Innocence. Mm -hmm. I no tengo uh, racial innocence. That applies especially for the Latinos here in the United States, getting a better understanding. Um, you know, like I said, the the naiveness that sometimes we have, and I'm not getting an understanding what. How? Because how we allocated, I'm like, the moment that you're black, God forbid somebody stops you, you know, they're not going to ask you, well, once they pick up the accent, fine, but at the moment that you present, you are what you are, and you're going to be treated as so. Mm -hmm. And also, the greatest mention that I can do, if you really want to understand it from that angle, the father of black history, Mr. Arturo Schomburg, 
also you can check. And I think there's a museum in New York, which yeah. I'm going to visit. I haven't been there. And obviously, um, more to say, we have to go to also Washington, D.C. to the Black um, Museum. Yeah, African American Museum. American National Museum. Yes. It's gorgeous. I just went three. Oh, you did? Oh my God. Nice. Yeah. Because there's four floors, you cannot possibly finish in one day. So, he ido cuatro veces y todavía me falta mucho que ver. Wow. Gorgeous. And I'll be back again because I'm not done. <laughs> and I take my kids because, and, and you know, one thing I, I want to point out too that the museum has a Afro Latino section. That I yes, so I heard about yeah, it. Yeah, they have like Celia Cruz there and other people. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that I feel. And, you know, not being Afro Latina, but understanding the importance of the education for people to, you know, about Afro Latinos, that really, like, they stole my heart with that because we're like, yes, thank you. Thank you for including that because, again, I feel so dumb. And, you know, so, I don't like you say, there's no shame in unlearning, yeah. you know. Hay que desaprender para volver a aprender, pero exactly. aprendemos de la misma. Y por eso me llevo a mis niñas, porque no quiero que se yes. find out the way that I found out. <laughs> no, so, and so it's we... like, it really also, like I said, in, in your whole purpose of your own business, it really helps for them because that's what we need, understanding and, and, and culture and education. And so that gives them an advantage incredibly so they know what, other people are feeling all be at least society sensory to understand empathy you know yeah. sympathy for what everybody else is going through yeah and for me that's why i named my my signature program diversity and anti-bullying because when you do not know how you are being part of that system that harasses and is mean to others just because of who they are um, that's because you really have not been educated on diversity and, and, uh, you know, you don't have empathy for the struggles that yes. you have. And, and when, when a person without empathy, empathy is a dangerous person, just, it doesn't matter how old they are. If they have no empathy for others, that's, that's dangerous. So I want to make sure that people get as much information by bringing people like you here to the podcast and educating us, having these like I said at the beginning, there are questions that people don't ever think to ask. Like, you know, cuando yo hubiera preguntado, oh, um, you know, I wonder if everybody ident and identifies as black. You know, like <laughs> as a kid, you know, I wouldn't sure. have unless you hear that conversation. You know, but some of us are not in spaces where those conversations are even had. So, yeah. yeah. But thank you. So these are great book recommendations. I'm going to um, go ahead and either buy myself one or go to Hoopla or go to my local library. Yeah. And, and yeah. And also I have to mention that I'm part of the Afro Latino forum. So they also, their website has many, many, many resources, uh, many breakdowns, but if you find, uh, I'm so sorry that it, I think it's like the Torah, but that's, that's definitely the title of the book, racial innocence. And that will be really and as i said once you tap on and also i can mention janelle martinez she's honduran hondureña americana honduran american with garifuna ancestry mm -hmm. and she also has the page in i latina and i think i have jamel also that is like am i enough so there's oh, several yeah. there's oh. several sources the community is growing and it's evolving we breaking generational cycles mm -hmm. or you know some people have curses but you know our we trying to make our ancestors proud and we you know events are taking place as we know it and the the word for us is just that we have to continue really joining and building our community the biggest thing that i have and i think that you mentioned and i don't know if i answer it is is supporting us funding us mm -hmm. i i pretty much very well known and acquainted with many of the afro latinx podcasters and then some people may ask the question but why they're not doing the podcast it's like guys you the support the finance uh, i i know like i mentioned earlier for most of us we have regular jobs but then we have this calling and passion and purpose to do these things but we also need you know help and don't get me wrong there's a lot of programs and grants coming out more and more for 
for helping us, but it goes in many, many, many ways. Yeah, definitely. And one of the ways that you can help, if anything, if you can't donate is by sharing a podcast, listening to it. Hey. Do it. Like, <laughs> as many times as you want. You can listen to the same episode too, as many times as you want. <laughs> Pero, you know, like put it on for your background sound if you need to. Pero <laughs> every little bit helps. <laughs> as Daddy, as yeah. yeah. You're dropping it. Yes, it's yeah. true. Share. Yeah. Share is caring, you know. Share it is, is caring. It really is. Joby, thank you so much for this amazing conversation. Once again, I am very happy that um, you're still doing this work and that you're not being discouraged. I will do whatever I can to support. And maybe we can come back another time and have another discussion because there were some in there that we were like, oh, that's a whole nother discussion. Maybe we should, we should <laughs> dare to do that. Love topics. Mm-hmm. And my last yeah. plug is that by the time I think this podcast comes up, but the, it will be available on YouTube. I'm working on a project with Revolución Digital Festival by Todo Wafi. And I will be the moderator for the Afro Latinx panel with not only Amara La Negra, Gloria Malone, mm-hmm. and Gadiel Del Orbe. Ooh, so wow. look out for those streaming on YouTube and we're going to have Barrio Chino. We have Asian Latinos. Yes, yes, yes. So yep, we are putting yep. everybody there. That's another conversation. Health. Yeah. We have the LG. Hopefully if I say it right. <laughs> the LGBTQ. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, we love you guys also. And we have entrepreneurship. I want to practice that L- LG- LGBTQ. LGBTQ Plus, yeah. panel, mental <laughs> yeah. health. Mm-hmm. We have uh, para, um, empoderamiento for mujeres and also um, business owners, creatives in films. As I said, it starts also, but all the content will be provided I, in YouTube. So look at the listing, look at the dates. And, you know, as I say, supporters, like you said, like earlier, daddy, sharing is caring. Yeah, and so where can people check out the data on your website? The dates they can check it on www. I would say todowafi.com. Todowafi.com. It's called the Revolution Digital Festival 2023. And I want to get a shout out to the CEO owner, Rafael Hernandez. We call it Rafi, and mm-hmm. he's doing amazing, amazing things. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really, really I love this conversation. <laughs> Hasta luego. We can, we can keep on talking, but we yeah. got to close out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Yobi. <laughs> Talk to you later. Thank you. Hey, did you like that episode? If you did, be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you may be listening and write a review. If you want more tips or some behind the scenes videos, make sure to follow my mom at Dolly Talks on Instagram. You can turn on notifications for her posts and stories as well. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. See you next time.